Hi, welcome back to the shack. We've been looking at emulating old computers. I'd like to look at an actual old computer in the same processor line as the PDP-1170 emulator that we looked at before. What you're looking at here is a PDP-1134, which is also a computer in the PDP-11 mini computer family. The PDP-11 family was originally released in 1970 with the machine that would eventually become the PDP-1120. It was just called the PDP-11 in 1970. And then various other processors followed after that. This machine is, as I said, a PDP-1134, which was released in about 1975, I believe, um, and then was revved a few times over the years. Uh, this particular machine is a little newer than that. It's a PDP-1134A. Um, this, the parts in this machine are from the 76, 77, maybe as late as early 1980 time frame spread out because it was built over, I believe, a number of years or pieced together over a number of years from several computers. As you can see, it needs some restoration work. Um, there's a lot of gunk and, and uh, dirt on the outside of the uh, machine itself. There's some stickers and things like that. Um, and we're going to do that work and we're going to get it running. But right now, I just want to give a quick tour of the machine. This, of course, is a, a VT100 terminal. This is actually a VT105, uh, which is a little bit newer than the mini computer itself um, from the early 80s, but would have often been used with a VT100. It's an appropriate terminal for use with uh, this system. Uh, in this rack over here, which was a typical installation for a PDP-1135, we have a uh, hard disk. This is an RL01 hard disk. It's a 5 megabyte hard disk unit that takes a removable hard disk platter. We'll spend some time looking at that uh, later, probably not in this video. Uh, here is the CPU unit itself. This is the PDP-1134 uh, processor and then the I.O. boards that drive things like the terminal, the hard disk, uh, and the floppy down there. On the bottom is an RX-02 floppy drive. I have it hooked up as an RX-01. We'll talk a little bit about the difference uh, between those in a minute, but it's a dual eight inch floppy drive. Each one of these doors right here is a floppy drive um, that would hold an eight inch uh, floppy disk. Now, uh, I think I mentioned the RL-01 is a five megabyte hard disk. The two floppy drives down there uh, as RX-01 configuration are about a quarter of a megabyte each. They're 250 kilobytes each. And an RX-02 configuration would have double that density and be about 500 kilobytes each. Now, I don't know exactly what this cabinet uh, weighs, but I'm guessing it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 or 350 pounds with everything installed in it. There is a power distribution unit in the back. Um, each of these units has its own power supply with heavy transformers. Um, there are three power supply, switching power supply units running off of a large uh, transformer in the back of this unit. Um, there are motors in both the floppy drive unit and this drive unit, and of course the whole thing is uh, effectively a steel and aluminum um, construction. So it's quite heavy, difficult to move around. It does have wheels, uh, but there are also feet on the bottom that I have put down uh, to keep it from moving around here in the shop. Um, in use, a machine like this would have sat in an office environment somewhere uh, in, in a machine room probably because it is rather loud. You can see if I, if I turn it on here, it's pretty loud. Uh, it would have been annoying to work in an office sitting right beside one of these. So often these machines would be in a machine room somewhere or in another room and then you would have cables coming into your workstations where you would have uh, the terminals that people would uh, work on. So uh, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the uh, internals of the CPU itself today. We'll talk more later about the drives uh, that are hooked at, to it and interfacing to it and things like that. I have some other terminal units that we can look at, but I'd like to give just a quick rundown of the CPU itself, um, what is involved with, with uh, putting together one of these CPUs and what you know, sort of functionality is provided. So the next thing I think we'll do is pull uh, this CPU unit out. Um, I will show you quickly. It is on rails and it pulls out of this rack. It will pull all the way out. And in fact, it can tilt down and tilt up to be able to get to different parts of the drive or of the, uh, uh, the cabinet. Uh, 
So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it out. I'm going to reposition the camera. We'll look down in it from the top and sort of see uh, what's inside the cabinet here. And then we'll take a look at the back plane on the bottom after that. All right, so here is the top of that same unit um, pulled all the way out of the cabinet. The cabinet is back here to the back. Uh, and the face of the unit is over here to the front. Um, and as you can see, it has a metal cover on it. I've loosened the screws. This cover lifts up and can move, be moved out of the way. And then what we have inside it is a set of cards inserted in a backplane. There are actually three backplanes in this unit. There's a backplane uh, right here that has nine slots, two of which are dedicated to the CPU unit. There's a black plane here that has nine more slots, and then a back plane over here that has four slots. We'll look more closely at those uh, here in just a moment. So the first thing I want to uh, show is the um, I.O. boards all have devices that they have to communicate with. So like this, for example, is a cord that goes to the terminal, the VT100 that we were looking at. Now, this would normally be a flat uh, cable that came out and went to a breakout panel. Um, for some reason in this machine, as I got it, it has round cords. I'm not super keen on that, but that, that's what it has. Um, and then here is a flat cable that goes to the hard drive and a flat cable that goes to the floppy drive. And these are routed out the back here through a strain relief. These two fans are the noisiest thing that we heard when we powered this on. They're high airflow, uh, high volume of airflow fans there. They're quite loud. Um, and of course, the machine could be run in this configuration. I could power it on if I were using it, you know, working on it, trying to get things uh, running. Uh, but in this case, the, the heat removal would not be as good as if it were in its normal um, operating position. Its normal operating position with the cover on, the air is drawn through across all of these boards, through these high airflow fans, across the power supplies, and out the back of uh, the unit. So what are we looking at when we look at this machine? Over here, these two metal ridges that you see right here are the actual processor of the machine. And these are what distinguish this as a mini computer rather than a micro computer. Uh, because if we pull out one of these processor boards and look at it, you'll see that it's made up of a large number of discrete logic chips. These are things like AND gates, OR gates, um, shift registers. Um, there's a couple of ROMs and some other things uh, on this board, but for the most part, it's just discrete logic. And there are two of these boards that work together to form a single working 16-bit CPU that's capable of addressing about a quarter of a megabyte of RAM. It's a little bit less because uh, there's some I.O. space in uh, the RAM space. Over here, uh, these are 75181 ALU uh, ICs. They can perform addition, subtraction, um, rotations, um, and or not, some things uh, like that. And then the rest of this logic together decodes the instructions that the CPU would run, turns them into operations to be performed on these ALUs or somewhere else on the board, and then um, performs a computation and then communicates it with the rest of the system. In a modern system, all of this would be one CPU chip on your motherboard. This would be the equivalent of your um, you know, core i3 processor or your ARM processor or whatever in a machine today. But in this machine, it takes up two full uh, CPU boards that are something like um, 14 inches long by say um, eight or nine inches high. Now, uh, all of the boards in this machine will have these dual um, finger slot extensions on the bottom. They're in pairs. Uh, the pairs are actually separated by a little bit wider gap than the space between the pairs. And each of these three are physically the same. The CPU is dedicated to two slots on the very end in a portion of the motherboard that can only hold the CPU. You can't put anything else in those slots. The rest of the slots in the machine, uh, with some minor variations that we'll talk about later, um, are effectively the same from one end to the other. So you could put most of your I.O. devices, your memory, etc., in almost any of the slots going across the rest of uh, the backplane. 
You may also notice that there are some connectors on the um, top edge of the CPU. If I put these boards back in the unit where they belong, move some cables out of the way, latch them in place. They have little levers here uh, that latch them down because they are such long uh, boards. It's otherwise it's hard to get even pressure. You push these levers down, it pushes down on this metal backplane and slides it into all six of the slots um, at the same time. But these two boards sit right next to each other in the backplane. As I said, by design, they must be immediately next to each other and they must be in these two slots. They cannot be placed anywhere else uh, in the system. And then they have these two connectors on top. Um, there is, these uh, boards can only do integer math. There is a third unit that would slot in immediately next to them here. This slot is not special, but the third unit must go beside these two and then would be connected to them by these pin headers in order to provide floating point computation. So there's a third board with a metal backplane just like these that would go right into that slot. I don't have it installed uh, right now because I'm still in the process of bringing this machine up. Not everything is working 100% uh, correctly. It will run just fine without it. And of course, we want to reduce the number of variables uh, while we get the machine running. In fact, I put some of these cards in here for demonstration purposes that would not necessarily be in here while I'm getting the machine uh, running. So that's these first two slots right here. After that, we have the two... Um, sort of banks. Oh, remember we had the six fingers here in three banks of two uh, that go down into the slots. The two at the top here are what are called the Unibus. The PDP-1134 is a Unibus machine. There were PDP-11s of both this variety and then a Q-Bus variety as well as larger machines that had some other types of buses on them. But as it was originally designed, one of the interesting things about the PDP-1134 is that it has this Unibus, which is the processor bus that communicates between the processor, the memory, and all of its peripherals. The unit in the name is, of course, one. And the interesting thing about it for the time was that there was only one bus in the machine. The processor, the memory, the high-speed peripherals, the low-speed peripherals, everything the processor talked to all went on the same bus as opposed to having a bus for the high-speed peripherals, a separate bus for the memory, a separate bus for the terminals and the other low-speed devices that went in the system. There was just the one bus. So that's these two slots right here. Um, and there's some differences between the slots that we'll, that we'll get to in a moment. And then down here, these remaining four fingers are what we call SPC slots, small peripheral controller slots. And then most of your I.O. devices would plug into those slots. So here, for example, is the floppy drive controller. Here is a terminal uh, controller. Some larger devices, typically for power handling and for um, mechanical reasons, they simply had to be physically larger, would plug into all six of the slots, both the Unibus slot and the uh, SPC uh, at, at the end. This is the hard drive controller. It is like that. In fact, an older version uh, of this hard drive controller, uh, I believe, was two boards that went beside each other to have the physical space for the, the chips on uh, the board. This is an RL11. There are some other controllers. There's a, a uh, separate kind of hard drive, a different kind of hard drive that, uh, in fact, used it was an RK drive that used four boards that went side by side in a four slot backplane that was dedicated just to that controller. So they could be um, sort of more complex if they needed to be. Now in this um, system, as I said, there's a nine slot black backplane over here. It runs from this CPU board to this terminal controller board right here. Then we have inserts like this one that have two sets of fingers on them that plug into both the uh, first backplane here and the second backplane right here, and they connect the Unibus from one backplane to the next. So with this pulled out, these cards right here, these uh, three cards on this side, are not connected to the CPU. They're in the physical cabinet. They would receive power if I powered it on, but they cannot communicate with the CPU. By plugging this in, I simply jumper each one of these pins, one to the other, directly from one backplane uh, to the other. 
you just slide it down in here, socket it into just the unibus portion of the back plane, and you connect the two back planes together. The unibus back plane contains all of the signals that are necessary for any of these cards to work. They're not in the most convenient configuration. The SPC portion of the back plane has them in a better configuration. In fact, the only usable configuration for some operations. Um, but the signals will propagate across the back planes using only the unibus slot. Now, the other cards in this chassis, we have the CPU here, we have the Unibus Jumper, and I've briefly mentioned some of the others, include this uh, M9312 right here, which is both the boot ROM and a bus terminator. In order that the electrical signals on the bus are clean from one end of the bus to the other, there must be certain electrical properties of the bus, including known calculated resistances that match the impedance of the bus uh, electrically on the board and, and the devices that plug into it. This provides resistances to create those impedances at the CPU end of the bus. And it also has boot ROMs on it so that the machine can boot up and do something useful immediately without having to toggle a program into the front panel as you would have on older um, mini computers. After that, we have a RAM board. Now this is the only MOS device in this system, at least to my knowledge. These are MOS RAM devices. Everything else in the system is TTL, transistor, transistor logic uh, versus metal oxide semiconductor logic uh, on this RAM board. This is uh, an MS11 LD. This is the uh, largest RAM board that was made by digital for this type of machines and it populates the entire memory of this system. This has a quarter megabyte of RAM on it and in fact this system uh, plus parity and in fact this system can only use 248k of this 256k of RAM. So by placing this into uh, this slot I am in one board populating this machine with as much RAM as it can possibly address, or the CPU can possibly address. And then, of course, we have the Unibus Jumper. And this board right here is the serial terminal driver. This is a DL11W. It has the serial terminal driver on it, and it also has a line clock. It feeds a low-voltage version of the 60 hertz AC signal coming in from the power supply at the back onto the bus as a 60 pulse per second clock effectively that can be used to keep track of actual wall clock time. The CPU clock that's on this is not necessarily a great and stable clock for wall clock time, whereas the 60 hertz uh, coming off the power bus is uh, pretty reliable. In fact, the, the power company is required to keep it within certain reliability um, tolerances. Now, one thing to notice about this board is the many banks of switches on this board. Uh, almost all of these boards can be configured in some ways. Normally they're done by dip switches. So if this board has a single serial terminal connection on it. It can run either an RS-232 um, serial terminal like we would use today, or it can run a current loop like a teletype. You've seen the, I'm sure, the um, uh, ASR-32 um, that's being restored uh, on Curious Mark's uh, channel. Um, that's a current loop device. This can provide the current uh, for that um, current loop, and it can also switch the current loop, uh, or you can use it with an RS-232 device as I am, which is a more modern serial signaling standard. This will do from, um, I don't remember exactly, I, th I think either 50 or 110 baud all the way up to 9600 baud, configurable on these switches, has one serial port, and then the line clock on it. Um, you can configure it to be at different addresses. You can put more than one of these in the system, uh, things like that. So, let me put this back in the slot here. In order to place these in the slots, you put them in a guide rail down the side, slide them down, and then push them as evenly as you can straight down into the slot until they uh, seat. And in fact, there is a foot that extends on this cabinet that comes out underneath this unit so that when you're pushing on it, and of course with the weight of this cabinet, it weighs over 100 pounds, uh, out here so you don't tip the whole thing uh, over as you push on it. Then the next board, as I said, was the hard drive controller. This is the RL11 hard drive controller. 
Um, this board, we'll get to this in a little bit, but is special in that it has to be plugged into certain slots. There are only some slots in this motherboard, or in the back plane rather, uh, that this controller can be plugged into because it uses DMA, direct memory access. It can write blocks that are read off the disk directly into memory without the processor becoming involved. And in order to do that, it has to be in certain special slots in the backplane. Any slot in the backplane can be one of those slots, but you have to configure them uh, appropriately. The next board here is a, this is another hex board, by the way. It has that metal back on it. It has the levers. It pulls out. It goes into all uh, six of the fingers in the bottom. Um, they call these um, dual, quad, and hex boards based on how many of those fingers they have. So a, a Unibus only card has only two fingers and it goes into a dual slot. Uh, the serial line controller and the floppy drive controller over here have four fingers and they go into a quad space. And then this has six fingers. The, the memory and the processor have six fingers. They go into a hex space. So the floppy controller, much like the uh, hard drive controller, plugs into this backplane and has a cable that goes out to the drive that it controls. This is a much smaller, lower capacity device. In fact, I believe it is not capable of DMA, and we'll get to why uh, later, either in this video or uh, another, but I need to verify that. Uh, this particular one is an RX-01 uh, controller, an RX-11. Um, it can control only single density floppies. There is an RX-211, I have one of those, it's not in this machine, which can control the RX-02 to access dual density floppies, or double density floppies. Then the final card, uh, large card, that's in the back plane here, is another terminator. So buses must be terminated at both the head end and the tail end. And if you look at this card, you can see it has literally just banks of resistors on it. And these are the termination resistors. Uh, that provide that characteristic impedance of the bus and ensure that the electrical signals sort of do the things we want them to do. Um, it also has a small amount of logic on it. This logic is used for what they call SAC turnaround, um, which is a, um, an acknowledgement of uh, requests that the cards in the system can make on the PDP-1134. Uh, earlier PDP-11s and in fact other many other PDP-11s in general do not require this extra logic. Uh, but this PDP-1134 does. So we put ba this back in the slot and we will look at the last kind of card that's in this motherboard, or this backplane rather. This is the last card that's in the backplane. This is what is called a grant continuity card. Now we'll talk about what grant continuity is and what um, processor grants are in a little bit. But this card basically ensures by bridging together uh, adjacent pins here on the card that certain signals, if they are not handled by the cards in the backplane, uh, will be connected from one slot to another. These slots down here that don't have cards in them must have that signal connected from one slot to another, and so you must place a grant continuity card uh, in the slots. These are often called knuckle busters. Um, and the reason for that is I don't have a, a large amount of knuckle damage right now. I do have some scrapes on the back of my hand. Uh, but reaching down between these cards to put these in and pull them out, you often tear up your hands on the uh, solder points on the back of the adjacent um, boards. There were other grant continuity cards that came all the way to the top and had a handle on them like this. I don't have any. Uh, I have only the little knuckle buster style. So if we push that back in, uh, this motherboard is now, or this backplane is now complete from here to here. It has either a card in every slot or a grant continuity card in every slot. It has a card that propagates the DMA signaling in every slot that is configured for DMA. And this particular backplane, um, I have um, wired it such that only these two slots have DMA uh, enabled. The Memory card does not use DMA, but it does provide the connection for the, uh, the MPG signal, we call it. Um, and so it can be put in a slot that is wired for uh, DMA, and it will 
propagate the signal from one side to the other. And the RL11 board, the hard drive controller board here, uses DMA, and so it propagates that signal. Any of the slots that are configured for uh, DMA operation must have one of those cards put in them. If I move this card to a different slot, this card would not work properly. And in addition, the back plane would not work properly and the machine would not boot uh, when I powered it on. We have to keep track of those things and we will look at them here in just uh, another moment. So that's the top side of the system. We have uh, the CPU and then all of the IO boards. In this particular system, uh, we could have 22 total boards in here. So the CPU and 20 other um, boards. In other systems, you could have as few as four or as many as uh, this 22. This is a full um, cabinet in banks of either nine or four. So what I'd like to do now um, is flip this machine up. I'll show you how that works and then take a look at the um, back plane on the other side and talk about what some of these signals are. The grant continuity cards, what they're doing, and then what the, um, uh, the, the difference between these end slots and the slots in between and some things like that that I think are uh, interesting. So uh, this is designed to be serviced in place. There are handles on the sides of the cabinet here that if I pull these handles, I can rotate the entire cabinet up like this. Now you're not looking at anything useful right now because there's a, a cover on the bottom uh, of the cabinet here, but if I loosen up these screws, I'll get a screwdriver and do that here in a moment, we can then pull the bottom of this cabinet off and see the back plane. And the reason the machine tilts up like this, and the reason it's capable of doing this, is that you would actually have to make changes to the physical wiring on the back plane in order to configure the system for things like those slots that we talked about. So let me move the camera down, get this cover off the bottom. It's the same as the cover on the top. I, I loosen two screws and it just lifts off uh, and we'll take a look at the back plane. All right, and here's the back plane. Uh, so each one of these yellow lines that you see here is an actual wire. It's a piece of Kynar uh, coated wire. Um, this is hat right here is a 30 gauge uh, I don't know if it'll come into focus, but is a 30 gauge wire that is roughly of the same type uh, that's on this back plane. And uh, someone would strip these wires and then use a wire wrap tool. I have a manual wire wrap tool here. They probably used an automatic wire wrap tool to wrap these wires around these individual pins that are sticking out of the back plane. There are, um, I believe, 72 pins in each one of these three banks. And there are wires routed between many of these pens, uh, although not all of them. So what we're looking at here is the bottom side of exactly that same board we were looking at before. The CPU slots are these two slots all the way on this end. So that was the uh, right hand side of the cabinet as we were looking at it before. The Unibus is these two slots uh, at this bottom side of the back plane here. And then the SPC is in these uh, four slot bays uh, up here. And so what we have is two slots here, you can see that are wired differently from all of the other slots on this back plane over here that connect the two CPU boards together. They have various wirings for the two CPU boards to communicate, as well as for the data plane board of the pair to communicate with the rest of the Unibus. So one of these two slots here, and I'm not actually sure which without uh, looking, uh, is actually Unibus wired, and the other one is wired for whatever of those signals the CPU might need. It doesn't have to be a, I'm sorry, it would be at this end. Uh, actually, it's obvious. So at this end, you can see that the Unibus portion of this is almost completely unpopulated, and then the next slot over has some wires uh, on it, although it looks like they may come from up in here. At any rate, I have to look at the wiring to see how this is connected. One of these two will be connected to the Unibus, the other one does not necessarily have to be. Together, they form a full processor. And then from there, we communicate with the rest of this board. So the first slot after these uh, at this end is where the Terminator is, is the first sort of Unibus slot on this back plane right here. And as you can see, the signals from the Unibus are wired down into the um, SPC portion of the slots down here. And for almost all of the pins, 
in this entire backplane, other than these two CPU slots, one pin on one slot is electrically connected to the same pin on the next slot over. The way this backplane is constructed, uh, the slot has connections on, on both sides, um, metal fingers on both slot sides. The one finger, the first finger in one sort of bank of uh, metal fingers will be on a pin that is, uh, for example, here. The second finger on the same side will be diagonally adjacent, and then it zigzags down. So these two rows of diagonally adjacent pins will form one side of one section of the six slot plane. Then the next two rows of diagonally adjacent pins, so, the, so we have one, two, three, four next to each other, one, two, three, four, will be the other side of that same slot. So this pin here, if this were a standard uh, portion of the backplane, which is not because of the CPU, this plane here would ordinarily be um, electrically connected to the one, two, three, fourth pin over from it. So there's three pins in between, uh, and it would be electrically connected to, no, I'm sorry, uh, one, two, three, four, and then it would be electrically connected to this pin uh, right here, which is the first, the equivalent pin of the, the next slot over. So as you can see, the Unibus is wired down into the SPC, and those sort of parallel constructions continue across this board. Then we would have the Unibus jumper that would go from this slot to this slot here, and then we have, again, those same wires doing that connection across uh, to this bank of uh, slots. Then a Unibus jumper to here, and then, of course, there's only four, so the wiring looks much denser, uh, but the same topology in this bank of four right here. Now, uh, it actually is the case that there are, on this particular backplane, this, this set of backplane, there are only one, two, three, four, five true unibus slots. And then in between those, there are seven what we call modified unibus slots on this backplane, two modified unibus slots uh, on this backplane, and six modified unibus slots on this backplane. And the reason for that is Unibus carries basically only five volts uh, power and then the signal lines. But there are many devices that require other power signals and cannot use some of the Unibus signals, etc. cetera. Uh, if they need them, they get them off the SPC portion of the bus uh, and, it, it, uh, and use more than one portion of the slot. And so these modified Unibus slots carry some extra power signals and remove some of the signals that are, that are present here in the SPC portion so that we can run things like those MOS memories, which require plus and minus uh, 12 or 20 volts, depending on the board and the power supplies in the system. Now, speaking of power, the power comes in down here at the bottom. There are some jumpers here that go to power supply units that are below this uh, below frame in the, the picture. Um, and then they come in and they actually go to the printed circuit board here on the back of the backplane. You might think that because we have this wire wrapped backplane that there aren't printed circuit boards here, but that is actually not the case. There are printed circuit boards uh, in here that hold these pins. It's just that most of the pins are not electrically connected to the printed circuit board. The exception is the power handling pins. The power planes are in these uh, printed circuit boards and they're wired directly to the pins that carry power, at least some of them. I'm not sure if all of them are. The uh, data carrying pins, however, are wire wrapped together using these wires uh, that were placed on the bus after the fact. And that means that the topology of these boards can be changed, although in practice, there are very few changes that were actually made in the field. However, there were backplanes that had different topologies. As I mentioned, there was a four slot backplane that held a, um, an RK disc controller and it was not wired as a Unibus backplane. It had a Unibus input at the top, a Unibus bus output at the top, uh, which is at the bottom uh, as, as it's configured here, but the remainder of the board, the inner slots and the remainder of this board were not Unibus slots. And the only thing that plugged into this uh, backplane, if it were an RK backplane, would be the RK controller and then the cables that connected it to uh, other Unibus backplanes. The one wiring change that's often made is related to interrupts and the 
DMA system that we talked about before. And that is what's called uh, the uh, NPG chain. So most of these are wired so that a, as I said, the pin here is directly electrically connected to the pin here, et cetera, across the board. So the sockets are all completely in parallel and the pins are electrically connected. The exception is pins that need to communicate between the CPU and exactly one card. When a device in this backplane has an, uh, an interrupt that it wishes to interrupt the CPU, it will raise a signal on a line the CPU will notice the signal and then send back an acknowledgement that it has received the interrupt. In order for that to work when more than one device might use the same interrupt, here in the um, C bank, they're lettered by the way, A, B, C, D, E, F. Here in the C bank, we have those, um, is that true? I think they're in the D bank. They're in the D bank, sorry, those are in, in, in the D bank, so A, B, C, D. We have those uh, interrupt signals, and what would happen is a card would raise the signal and break the chain at that point, so that it is not electrically connected from one uh, slot to the next, so that when the CPU acknowledges that interrupt, that card receives the acknowledgement, even if another card farther down the bus had also asserted the same interrupt signal. It would not receive the acknowledgement. This card, say, would then close the chain. This interrupt signal would be received by the CPU. The CPU would, receive an would send an acknowledgement, and it would go to the card that was farther down the chain. Um, in order to accomplish this, Instead of the wires being connected all the way through, they will come in on one pin of the card and go out on the next, as we saw on the Grant Continuity card. On this card, they come in on one pin and go out on the next pin. They jump from one pin to the next uh, across, I guess, across this way uh, on the board. If the device that's in that slot does not wish to use interrupts, it does exactly what the grant continuity card does, and it just electrically connects the pins together. But if it does wish to use interrupts, it disconnects them and puts active logic devices in between that can either connect them or disconnect them based on uh, the needs of the card in the slot. Now, for the grant continuity pins, this is all very well defined, and all of the cards that do not use a particular interrupt just have a jumper on their printed circuit board like this, and they provide continuity across the slot. Maybe some very old cards didn't, I'm not sure. However, for the cards that do DMA, which is in the C bank down here, these very bottom pins in the C bank down here uh, are the non-processor grant lines, which are used for DMA, where a device would say to the processor, hey, I want to use the, the Unibus. Please leave the Unibus alone, allow me to have it. So the card would assert that signal and then the processor would communicate back, okay, the bus is yours, you can have it. So that only one card would receive that, the bus is your signal. Um, it has a similar broken topology as the um, continuity lines, uh, or I'm sorry, as the interrupt lines up here. And so what we have is, and it's going to be very difficult to see, I will zoom you in here in a moment, is little links that are twisted from this pin to this pin and then again from this pin to this pin, from this pin to this pin, et cetera, electrically connecting those pins on the back plane. However, where there is a slot, as this slot right here, uh, where there is a slot where you would put a card that uses DMA, those links have to be broken, actually cut out and removed from the board. Um, that is the case for this slot here where the um, hard drive controller was, and it's the slot case for the slot over here, uh, one of these slots in here where the memory was. Now, in my case, the memory doesn't do DMA. It, it can't assert DMA, it is the memory device. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but it happens to jumper that connection so I don't have to connect the pins on the back plane over here. If I wanted to move this hard drive card somewhere else on this back plane, I would have two choices. I could either move it exactly to the slot where the memory card is, and then wire these two pins physically together, or I could cut the link on one of these other slots, move it to that slot, and wire these two pins together. Now, let's, let me bring you in closer here, and we will look at 
the um, how these things are wired together and how we would connect or disconnect these depending on whether we want a DMA on a particular slot. Now what we're looking at here is only the C bank uh, of the middle of the three back planes in this uh, board. And so as you can see right here, there is a little wire link right there that goes diagonally between these two pins. It's connecting this pin to this pin. These two uh, pins represent two adjacent fingers in this first bottom end here of this C slot on this portion of the back plane. And then these two pins here represent those same fingers on the next slot over. However, if you can see, there is no diagonal link between these two pins right here. Um, it's also interesting to just generally look at the topology of this and how these things are linked together. So you can see, for example, that this pin here is wired to this pin, which is the equivalent in the very next slot, and then there's another jumper that goes to the same pin here, to the same pin here, etc., across this. So you can physically see the chain across uh, the back plane at this particular pin level. Now, why this chain goes across the back plane here and doesn't run down to the unibus slot and back up, as many of these others obviously do, I, I don't know. I mean, we'd have to look at the specification and try to figure out why they would choose to run it in that way. But at any rate, here we see something different, which is jumpers within pins on the same slot, or missing jumpers for those pins on that slot. Uh, now here, it's, it's tough to see, but there's another diagonal link right there on this slot, on this slot, on this, uh, this, all the way across the board. So the only one in this that does not have continuity is this particular slot right here where I have the hard drive uh, put in. And uh, we could check this with a multimeter by putting a multimeter lead on this pin right here and a multimeter lead on this pin right here. If there were... Uh, grant continuity all the way across this back plane, then there would be zero ohms resistance from end to end. However, with this link missing and with a card in the slot, we would see a higher resistance. With no card in the slot, we would see uh, an open circuit. So you can ring out this back plane to determine where your um, hard or where your uh, DMA capable slots are by just checking from slot to slot and seeing where that continuity is present. So if I checked from this pin to this pin, I would get continuity. Uh, but if I checked from this pin to this pin, I would not get continuity if I rang it across this uh, board because of the missing uh, links, um, uh, or the missing link rather on these pins right here. So uh, I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, modern systems would have similar uh, signaling mechanisms, but the fact that it was left sort of exposed to the user here on the back plane in the PDP-11 is not something that we see on modern systems. You never have to uh, solder wires into or remove wires from your motherboard when you stick a new video card in it, you know, in a modern system or whatever. But at this time, it was not expected that you necessarily stuck devices in your own computer. Rather, you would call a digital technician and the digital technician would come out and, and place the device in and do any rewiring that needed to happen. Um, some other interesting things to see on this back plane, as you can see, there are these twisted um, wires in here. I haven't looked up exactly what they are. I'm assuming they contain some sort of AC signal, maybe the 60 hertz signal or something like that. Uh, and that is to quiet, you know, whatever noise uh, would be on that. You can also see on this back plane, if I move the camera over, uh, there are some blue wires. Here's a blue wire right here. This was a, this is in fact a, um, uh, an NPG link that was put in by a previous owner of this machine. Apparently this link on this back plane was cut out at some point in time and then the, a previous owner said, well, I want to put a card in there that doesn't use DMA and rewired that link. I also put one in right here. Uh, this uh, slot right here uh, was wired for DMA and I didn't want to use it so I took the wire wrap tool and I wired that one. Uh, right there. So in 2020, when you don't have a deck technician to just call and have them come out and wire your machine, you do that sort of work yourself. So I hope you found that uh, little tour interesting. Uh, a walk through a 16-bit mini computer uh, from the 1970s.
Um, we'll look more at this machine later. In particular, this machine has some unreliable bits. I would like to get it uh, working more reliably. I have a completely reliable machine uh, that's put together uh, that's, that's not here right now. It's in my office. Um, but this machine is not completely reliable. Some things work, some things don't work. It needs uh, some um, sort of TLC to bring it back to 100% working order. And we'll look at how some of these things work in some more detail um, in the future. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this walk through the sort of uh, physical architecture of the machine. Um, I apologize that some of these shots were probably a little boring with nothing but nothing but my hand in the picture, but hopefully you like some uh, juicy 70s computer goodness. So thanks a lot for watching and we'll catch you in the next video.